Hello, Jan Recker. Hey, Nick Parente. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, so we had this podcast with Will Vander Alston, Brian Pentland last time. And towards the end of the podcast, I feel like we could have continued that discussion for a couple more hours. Uh, and maybe one day in the future we will. But towards the end of the podcast, now these are two of the most accomplished scholars, right? Uh, I know. And we are very them, different, very different people, right? Yeah. But accomplished, absolutely. Yeah. But incredibly accomplished by any measure. Right? Yeah. Uh, sure. And, and at the end, we asked them, well, what's your advice to say young researchers, right? And, uh, and I had I wrote down what they what their actual comments were, will said, forget about where you publish, focus on what you want to do, and where it has impact. Right? Yeah. And then Brian agreed. He said, that's great advice. And then uh, he put it a different way. He said, try to find a story because he thinks in stories or a problem uh, that you can continue working on. And he thought that it was phenomenon driven is the way to go. And we've had discussions, remember with Brad Greenwood about that and find a phenomenon uh, and, uh, and go after it. Right. So I was thinking about this then and afterwards and and, you know, I'm thinking, is that good advice? Well, y y you may have realized, like, when, when Will came out and said this, I was pretty annoyed <laughs> straight away because I was like, man, that's, that's generic textbook advice and that's not helping anyone. Yeah. You know, it's just, okay, yeah, of course we're going to do this. Of course young students are going to do this. But, you know, next day out, Monday morning, 9 a.m., that advice isn't helping anyone. You know, right. so he, he, so that and he, he sort of admitted this. He said that, OK, you know, it's it's easy for me to say it's easy for him to say after he has 100,000 citations and 250 odd papers to his name. And mm -hmm. then he said, you know, follow your passion uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and do these things. But if, if you're sitting there and you're let's say let's let's say you're a final year PhD student. You've done a few studies, none of the papers are out, but you're sort of trying to wrap things up and you're on the job market and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do next. And then what people, what I always think is what people often forget, what stage of their lives are they in? I know it's a bit different in the US, but in Europe, these are kids, there are, so they're not kids, but they're sort of end 20s, early 30s. Typically, they got a partner. Some of them have a kid or they're, they they want to have a kid, they want to get married, you know, uh, and and that's the situation they're in and then it's very easy to say yeah. oh you know follow something that'll keep your interest for the next 20 years oh yeah, by the way you love. also yeah. make some money so you can sustain your family and make sure you even get into the system i think that's the key challenge isn't it getting into the system so you got all that flexibility and freedom to pursue your dream and your passion yeah yeah and and i think that, so that's just it the, i agree with you that i don't think this was good advice for say doctoral students, maybe for junior faculty, it's starting to get to be good advice. But I think it's one of those things where we're sampling on the people who actually, I mean, if you think, and, and I brought this up in our conversation, I'm like, you know, people who are good methodologists do fine. People who follow a phenomenon, uh, especially early seem to be fine, but it's the ones who have an idea. So I was actually looking around a bit and I'm thinking, all right, who are the people like, like, what are the different ways, the different paths to uh, achievement? And, and here's the deal. Most people are not going to be Will Van Der Alst or Brian Pentland, right? These folks have a something. The reason we had them on the podcast is because we associate an entire uh, genre with each of yeah, them, right? Absolutely. We, we yeah. associate basically organizational routines, research with Brian Pentland. Yeah, like a community, a, an actual yeah. community of people, not just two or three, but, you know, in the hundred or hundreds. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they both kind of represent a key, if not the key person, certainly a key person in, in their respective communities. So we're sampling on the dependent variable. We're saying, how do you get success from two people who have reached pretty much the pinnacle of success of research in their field? And, and I'm not sure that's a formula that the rest of us mortals can follow. And yeah, maybe if you, if you look at their lives, that's what they did. And maybe, but here's the deal. I don't believe that's what they did. I don't think either one of them in their PhD said, 
this is what I want to do and I'm going to follow it, right? It was far more of a serendipitous path that led them into this. And because Brian was doing his uh, process, he started thinking about process and then he fell into routines and Nelson and Winter and what, and then he, he went that route, right? That's not what he set out to do. Well, know? So, so two points. Number one, I, I want to backpedal a little bit. I mean, it was good. It is good advice. My no, problem not. is it's just not very, it's not actionable. Like it doesn't tell me what I should be doing tomorrow. Like, no, yeah, I think it's bad it's good advice. advice. It, it's, okay. It's, well, why do you think it's good advice? Do what you want to do. Well, I think it's good advice in the sense of that's the ideal view of what an academic should be doing. You know, that's what we are should be doing. And that even in a, in a way, that's even what the system around it is meant to provide us with the freedom to do. So like, sort of, if you think about it, once you have tenure, uh, you're uh, freed from all sorts of obligation, you have sufficient income to sustain a family. So all the worldly matters are taken care of. And that is meant to put you in a position that you can do exactly what, what these guys have been doing. So I have no problem with that. So that's, that's good in this sense. And in a way, that's even what we are meant to be doing in, the, in a very idealistic historical sense but it doesn't help us because the reality isn't like that um, and the mm -hmm. reality also isn't like this now so you mm -hmm. said they, they didn't they didn't set out to do this and may, maybe they did but i think that the reality is both of them are obviously a little bit older than the two of us young handsome folks um, and maybe back then it was like that and maybe maybe it was maybe they had the entire freedom to do so and it, it's it's yeah. it's well possible i mean i always think that when i was a postdoc and if i compare that experience which is probably around 15 years ago say and then i compare that to the postdocs that are working with me or that i know now mm -hmm. man i'm so happy i don't have to be a postdoc no i'm really yeah. am happy it's why just what's a, the difference a, well, the, the difference is now that you have an enormous pressure of, uh, of publishing and building a record very early on just to be able to get into the system. With getting into the system, I mean landing that faculty position that has at least a possibility of you know, having a, a long-term employment, like a, like a tenure track type of uh, position, to, just to get into that stage. See, yeah. very, very... like. Here's, here's the story. Like a couple of years ago, I was working with a postdoc while I was still in Australia and we worked on a, on a paper for many years and it was an FT50 journal. So it was supposed to be a good one. And, you know, eventually we, we managed. Yeah. And you know what the reaction was of my postdoc? Hmm. It was like, one down, two to go. You know, that's the reaction. Uh. And I contrast that with my very first top paper, whatever, coming out of the PhD, right? I was genuinely happy. I think I camped for a week and drank whiskey every day for like a week. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was the happiest yeah. clown on, on that freaking island that I was on, right? So, yeah. and you know, it was just pure elation, pure elation and pure happiness. And this guy wasn't happy. He wasn't happy. Yeah. He was, if at all, he was a little bit- Counting. Yeah, he was counting down and, uh, you know, he couldn't even be happy about it anymore. And I said, man, you gotta, you gotta celebrate. You gotta be happy. So what you're saying is it's it, it might be- it's good advice from, as you're saying, an idealistic or an idealized uh, view of what an academic should be, and we should find a puzzle that interests us, and then we should throw ourselves into it and and let the chips fall where they may, and don't worry about it. And and uh, and that's really how you be excellent. And and maybe it is. And maybe there are some of those brilliant people who just have a something driving them, and they get into it, and, and that's what they should do. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about those people who literally have something driving them, are driven, have a pro and, and are, are, right? I'm talking about the rest, the 99% of the rest of us who are, you know, smart enough. You make enough. it sound like the 99% are sort of lesser mortals and these are, these are higher echelon people. I don't even see it this way. I just think there are a multiplicity of career ways mm -hmm. and they are very good within that model of a career that they've chosen. Yeah. But no, I'm going to give you, and this is what I think actually happened with them, which isn't what they're saying, but it's what happened. I think there's this, and it's what we tell our young people. We tell them just do, do what uh, you want, do what makes you happy. You know, we give them this nonsense stuff. What we don't realize is that desire follows ability, right? What interests you follows your ability to do the thing. You don't tell people do what you're interested in, you know, and, and, and then everything gets fine you have them do hard stuff. And that's what PhD programs do. We expose them to, you know, methods, we expose them to ideas, and then, and then they find something difficult, 
that they have an affinity for and the interest, the love, the desire follows that. And, and I think that's what happened and that's what continues to happen. And, and that's what young people should do is go after the hard stuff. If you're, you know, go after next generation methods, go after the really difficult conceptual puzzles, go after, you know, the, the hard stuff and s- try a few of them. And the one that you're okay at, right? That you have a little bit, then the interest follows and then the love follows and the interest follows, but it's because you exposed yourself to very difficult things, right? Is that what he did? I mean, like it's an interesting advice. I've never thought about it this way and I certainly haven't done it. I don't think, well, maybe this is 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 exactly what happened to me. This is what he did. Like you said, okay, what's the hardest thing I could possibly do? Not intentionally. Looking back and, and again, I'm not Will Vanderalster, Brian Pentland, but my some my little competitive advantage as an academic, I think, is that uh, you know social theory and, and philosophy of science I read very thoroughly, right? And I'm not the strongest in our field, but I am strong enough to be able to write and review in these areas a bit. And what happened is when I got into my PhD, I wasn't interested in that stuff. But then I met Dick Boland, I met Kali Lutinen, uh, Young Jin Yu. These guys had me reading books. And they had me reading social theory. And then I was reading philosophy. I read Habermas, right? Uh, This was hard and it was painful. And I remember reading Giddens the first time. I would, most of the things Giddens cites, whatever, Levi Strauss and whoever, he's just putting in. I didn't know any of these people. I was sitting there on Wikipedia and on the Stanford Encyclopedia looking up. And and it took me whatever, an hour to read two pages, just because I had no idea what he's talking about, right? And and in doing that, I built a a capacity for these things that uh, has paid off and and that I got excited about. But the the love followed the hard work. It didn't precede it, right? No, yeah, I agree. But, you know, I think there's two learnings here. The one learning is that you were able to self-reflect in the real and it's like, what is my, you call it the competitive advantage. And I would agree, like from the outside, I'm looking at it like, okay, you know, your advantage is you've read more than most people that I know. You know, you are very firm on, on, on several of these different social theories, etc. So that is a competitive competitive advantage, and you know it and you use it. So that's good, but that means you got to be able to self-reflect on that. So that's I think that's a that's an actionable advice. Like you can because you can train that. You can train, you say, like, okay, trying to learn self-reflection, try to understand what you're good at, maybe in areas that others are not good at. The second interesting thing you said is something um that you just mentioned in passing, and that is one of my big uh, things, is you mentioned that you had uh, people that are around. You mentioned Dick Boland, Young Jin Yu, and, and Kali, and, and, and others. And I think that's a key role. Because one of yeah. the things that I wrote down here is that I had a look at, okay, what are sort of the role models around me that I had sort of a little bit of access to who had a particular career, and they were different in their careers, but they're all pretty successful. Mm-hmm. And, and then I asked myself, well, do I want to model that career? Let me make that very specific. I mentioned this before. One of my first big influences was Ron Weber, just mm-hmm. as a person, uh, because he was so humble and so sm- smart. And, you know, and, 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 if you, and then I looked him up and I read about him and so forth. And that, that is an interesting career move because he worked on one single idea for 40 years. You know, he worked on one ideas and he, you know, later told me the story, what the idea was and how he came to it, et cetera. He, he tells the story that it was on sabbatical in NYU in the eighties. And he was sitting there overlooking New York and he was thinking about what, what's the core of an information system. And that's what he's done. And he's done that till mm-hmm. the year 2021. Yeah. You know, if you asked him now, and maybe we should, he would say, I failed. That's what he would say. He said, <laughs> I failed uh, with my idea because it didn't, you know, it couldn't convince enough other people. But I always mm-hmm. marveled at that career because it was like Brian in a way. It was focused on one idea. It, they did one thing for 30, 40 years. For, mm-hmm. for Brian, it was routines. For, uh, for, um, for, for Ron, it was the nature of an information system. Will is a little bit different. Will has said himself, he had three or four ideas. You know, he had a, he had a, the process analysis, he had workflow management systems, and now he's into process mining and sort of data science. Mm-hmm. These are all connected, of course, but they're three or four ideas, and he published a big program of work. So to me, that's a mm-hmm. different type of career model. And the third example I wanted to bring up is my own advisor, Michael, Michael Roseman. He's a sort of 
you know, he for, to the outside, he probably looks like an engaged scholar, very phenomenon driven, runs out, looks for opportunity, and then does research on them. But he's really a, a first idea type of guy. He was always interested in the first idea and writing that first paper with an idea, with a new concept. And the funny thing always was once it's like an he had idea it, generator. Yeah. yeah, he's an idea generator. And once the idea was out there, like he was the most excited person you will ever meet about the idea. And he went out and told mm -hmm. the students, you got to be more excited about the idea. And you got to think that's the best idea since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what he literally told the people. But as soon as the idea was out there, you know, he's the off to the next gone. one. He yeah. was off to mm -hmm. the next one. Right. So he had some really mm -hmm. good ideas. And, but he never, he was never interested in whether they, you could make them work and whether you could scale them or, you know, testing the boundaries of it all. He just wanted to get the ideas out. So again, a very different um, uh, profile because he made a career out of having many first ideas. Well, and then there's the, oh, what was it? The uh, uh, foxes versus hedgehogs, right? Isaiah Berlin had this idea. You don't know, don't know what that is. Uh, so there's the fox and the hedgehog and the hedgehog knows one thing very well. And the fox knows a little about a number of different things, right? <laughs> and that's what Isaiah Berlin said that there was, uh, you know, and, and I think Isaiah Berlin was talking about academics, right? And, uh, and it compared the foxes versus the hedgehogs. And I think that's what we see, right? I would say Brian Pentland is definitely a hedgehog. <clears throat> in, in, in Ron Weber, a hedgehog, right? These are, these are people who have their thing and they go after it. And then, you know, my advisor, Kali Lutanen, is definitely a fox, right? He's everywhere. Even his PhD is like computer science, economics, uh, studied Habermas. I don't know what he, he actually, <clears throat> he has no one thing, right? So, so there are the foxes and maybe that's uh, Michael Roseman and that sort of thing. Uh, but so, so they work. Here's the thing that why the advice of senior people to say things like this uh, I think don't work. The first is because love follows ability. It doesn't precede it, right? Interest follows uh, some success. It does not precede the success. Um, you're right. It has to do with your conditions and not everybody is as fortunate as I am or you are to be surrounded by these, these really uh, phenomenal mentors. But, uh, but I think the other big issue with the current age and is, is this journal counting. And I think yeah. it used to be just the United States and just a handful of top business schools. Uh, lately, it's every business school, every top business school in the United States. So for example, University of Notre Dame, where I am, it's always been ranked very high as far as a teaching school. Uh, <clears throat> but research, it didn't take that much to, to maybe be tenured, you know, 30 years ago or something like that. Then somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 years ago, they said, well, if we're going to have academic credibility, we need to publish at the levels that other top schools are publishing. And this pretty much happened across the board in the U.S. So if you're at a top, say, 100, 150-ish school, you and you're a professor, you need to publish in the top journals if you're in a business school. And, and those top journals are few. In America, it's the UT Dallas list. The Financial Times list is okay, but the UT Dallas list is the kind of, uh, uh, it's the smaller list and, and it's the one, these are the actual A's and, and that's the only way you're gonna get tenure. So that's the reality these kids are in. And if you're telling them, well, do what you love, don't worry about where you publish, but oh, you won't get a job and you won't get tenured in the United States. Well, now maybe you should start worrying about where you get published, right? And you should start, you can't help it, right? And, and this trend moved over to the other places as well, right? So when I graduated with a PhD in Australia, this was the time where they started building their own uh, journal ranking list. So I was really still in the position where people didn't care what outlet a publication was in. So whether, you know, very bluntly, whether it was a conference paper or journal paper. So for my first faculty job, it didn't matter. And I, I had to put in a, a tenure package. I am not sure so there was something Australia. like, yeah, that was in Australia, but I'm not sure I had to put in, you know, this is a, a so-and-so ranked outlet. I think I just said, I published so-and-so many papers, end of story. So this only started then. So this was around 2005 to 2010, I suppose. Now it's very different, right? Now in Australia, uh, it, same yeah, exact in Australia it, it's, it's, it's similar to the US. So they got a um, national ranking list and they're all modeled on the same thing, right? They're modeled on FT50 or in this case also by ABS, which is the British equivalent and a little bit of their local flavor in there as well, I suppose. And then of course, in Australia, you also have that big impact statement movement that's also carried over from the, from the British side of things. So it's sort of 
now not only do you have to publish a lot you also have to create impact you know you have to you have to everyone has to do everything that's my other big problem right and then the funny thing is now when i moved to germany i thought okay germany very traditional university system it'll be less metricized there and that's mm -hmm. what I thought. I was very wrong. Like Germany is a lot about rankings. I'm not sure whether this holds true for all of the universities, but the ones that I've seen, they're counting like hell. Yeah. Like they're counting to the point that no one even reads anymore. They just count. Well, and it, it, that's the issue. So you're running into the issue right there. And they say deans, uh, business school deans can't read, but they can count. <laughs> well, it's not only deans, man. I was, um, this is this is my, my favorite story about this. I was, uh, at one stage, I was asked to give a, a keynote uh, to the ISIS doctoral consortium, you know, where they invite the 40s most promising sure. PhD students, etc. And Shirley Greger invited me um, to say, can you come in and do a keynote on academic career? Something, mm -hmm. something like this. So I, I went in and I talked to them and then you have dinner with all the students, of course. And the, the students um, at, at the dinner table, I said, oh, Jan, you're, not, you're number 13. I was like, number 13 of what? What is that? And they knew my ranking at that, in that year on Venki's <laughs> ranking list. They knew yeah. that, yeah? yeah? And I was like, okay, do you, know what, do you know what I'm doing? Do you know what problems I'm studying? No. Do you know what methods I'm using? No, not, nothing at all. Okay, but you knew my ranking better than I did. So then I asked him, what are you doing? You know, so fellas, what are you doing? Oh, I'm writing this paper for ISR. I said, that's not what I asked. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? Honestly? Yeah. So, so this is oh. not, this is, this is deeper than just deans counting, counting, uh, you know, your, your profile. This is, this goes deeper into the students themselves. That's what they know. They, they would know better than you what ranking you have this year compared to last year compared to whatever else. But um, I wonder whether they know who's the, who's the biggest expert in IS security at the moment. You know, well, or hopefully they, they, they go know to die that. for experiments. Yeah. Hopefully they know their domain, but but you'd need. So I always looked at it this way, that these top journals are kind of the price of admission to this wonderful game. Right. Yeah. And I publish in everything. Right. I'll send it to bad journals. I'll send it to practitioner journals. And then I just have fun and I, I like writing and I like getting ideas out. So in that sense, maybe I'm like Michael Roseman to some extent. Uh, where I like to, and maybe I'm not the idea generator, but I like to participate in the idea generation. Uh, so for me, it's fun, but I always figured this whole time to be able to hang around with young people and teach them to be able to have this wonderful international conference, meet, become friends with people like you, uh, right? Even, I don't know, it's a mixed blessing. <laughs> very, very mixed. Uh, but, blessing. Oh, but uh, you know, the price of admission is I have to knock out these A hits every yeah, once in a while. Yeah, and I, have and no, I can actually have no problem with that. It's just a market uh, mechanism. <clears throat> so, so that's the way, way I look at it. And the nice thing is there, if you do really high quality work, I think it gets recognized. It may be not the first journal, you know, you'll get whatever, but you know, usually two or Amrit Tawana had this idea that you send it to three top journals if you think you have a good paper. And if it gets rejected from three top journals, then maybe you're missing something. Right. But usually, and I think there's something to that. If you have really good, good work, that's a very nice rule of thumb. You know, you try yeah. three and then at some stage you got to realize maybe this idea isn't all that good. <laughs> it's not as great as I think it is. Yeah. And, and then you go to another, I would, I would then send it to a second tier journal. Uh, the problem with sending to a second tier journal is that oftentimes the review process is just as stringent as a top tier journal. And here I am having to juggle and, and I don't want to anymore because there's very little reward. The advantage of sending it there is that it might still get picked up and noticed. So there's this trade-off. Uh, uh, if you're sick of it at that point. I'm, I'm still, I'm very, like, that's what I mean with your mentors or the people around you. I'm still, I, if I look at myself, a little bit of that self-reflection, I'm still very influenced by the school of thought that I was trained in. I'm still very much a, a student of Michael. Like he couldn't care less about the, um, uh, the journals. In a way, yeah. I always thought that he always wanted to hit certain journals. But again, yeah. like the big idea, once he hit him, he couldn't care less. He couldn't care less about the second, like so, you know, yeah. or the third, or the fourth. Or the so you fifth. check that box. I you check the box. Yeah. And if you look at if you look at where I publish, I publish all over the place. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I hit uh, some top ones, and I had more of the ones that go where I try to pick the best place for the audience. That obviously doesn't always work. Obviously yeah. not. You know, and and the hard thing there is obviously letting go at some stage. That's really but, tough. Otherwise, you get get bogged down. But that's for your own career. If you're dealing with young people, the idea is, hey, they're in a different world. They haven't established their names and it is counting 
right? It's all counting anymore. You're in Germany uh, 15 years yeah. ago and MISQ in Germany, no one cared because they didn't, you know, ISIS, a Hicks conference was as good as a MISQ for some. Well, they had, a, they, had a different, they had a different system, I suppose. But you, you're right. I mean, the, the key thing now is that people need to realize the tension and they need to figure out a way to, to managing this. And that could be that you have a close look at your ideas and you do try to pick the best idea and send it to the best journal. And you'd be stupid not to. And that's what I mean with, with Will's and, and Brian's advice. It's really nice to play the long-term game about the idea and persist with this and publish. What, what did Will say? Publish. Don't, don't look so much where you publish. That's just not a good advice for a young finishing PhD, a young postdoc. They got to follow their, that idea and at the same time, sort of play that publication slash ranking slash productivity game to get into the system yeah. you know um i so remember gonna... yeah go for it go ahead no I, I just wanted to mention a story uh, a very influential moment for me was i was at a, a little workshop somewhere and i met, met eric walden eric walden very nice guy and uh, he at that time just became got tenure and literally that summer he changed his entire domain he said I did my research on this particular domain that he was in so I can get tenure because I know I'm going to be productive here. I can get papers out, et cetera. And then mm. the moment he got tenure, he stopped what he was doing and he moved into this other field, which in his case was neuro-IS, sort of neuroscience mm -hmm. information system, because yeah. that was of interest to him. And he told me, I, I, you know, I got to this point and now I can do what I want, so I will. And I always thought that was, you know, it's obviously ambitious and it's um, courageous, and kind of cool. That's also a good yeah. career move, right? Yeah. But he did it very smart in the sense of we waited until he was in, so to speak, in the yeah. system until he did this. Very good idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so there are two things I want to kind of still cover. The first is uh, the dysfunction that journal counting has done, and there's got to be a backlash. Uh, and let me, I, I know at Temple University, for example, they give you money for your A hits and your salary actually goes up for your A hits. So what that does is creates a situation where people are not focused on the scholarship, not focused on the interest at all, only focused on the journals, right? Maybe not so much in the IS group there, maybe, but, but in, you're, you're creating a situation where many, many uh, publications is the key. So you end up just driving and, and these people, people have multiple projects going, they're moving them along incrementally, they're moving them along superficially, and not just at Temple, all over the place. If all we're doing is journal counting, there's a way to game it. And there's a formula to getting into journals. And uh, there are people figuring it out. And it's a totally anti intellectual way of, of well, doing okay. these things. And it's, it's sad, right? Well, you put it in very negatively. A different way to put to tell the same story would be to say that's at the moment in the system we're in, that's one way to constructing your uh, career is to go by breadth. I had the same point, very differently. And said, like one way of constructing a career is, of course, to have many, many, many publications and try to maximize that. That is a career mm -hmm. move. And we know many people that, have, that are doing this at the moment. At the moment, the system is placed in a way that it would, would reward that. Maybe yeah. like Temple and other places, literally that they give you money for it. Money, but even yeah. if not, you have reputational gains and, and so forth. You, you, you know, you top the, the ranking lists and you end up in the newspapers because you publish a lot and, and a lot of people count a lot. So, of course, mm -hmm. that's a move. The question is, if you wanted to do this, I think there's two things. Number one, does it gel with you, with your own view of what an academic should be doing? And from you, I gather, you, you, you know, you're not cool with this. You, 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 you figure we're supposed to be doing something different. You mentioned we, that's, you know, that's not intellectual pursuit. Uh, the second thing is, of course, well, even if you wanted to do this, you got to bring something to the table, right? Yeah, it's still so, hard work. It's not it's like, it's, of course it's, it's, not like it's easy. And, yeah. and one of the ways I think where that is possible, and that's another type of, uh, I guess, career stereotype that I think we have in our field, which worked really well for the people is, um, for example, there can be the method expert. So I always think, I'm not sure he would agree with this, but Supratech Soccer. To me, if I look at his profile, he's obviously the qual guy, the, the case study guy. And if you look at his uh, publication record, he worked on all sorts of topics and he's worked with all sorts of team with many, many, many different people on many different projects. And he, 
he was always the guy that made sure that they got the rigor side under control. So that I think is a completely valid way of constructing your career to be the method guy that other teams that have good ideas or have good data, but that, that need that expertise. And that could be you. And then sometimes you, and then sometimes you write some of those key papers around the methods and then exactly those... that come with this as well. Right. So he right. to me is the, is the method guy. Uh, he, had, he had, because he had so many different foci in his papers that I don't see a clear, you know, like a clear problem of phenomenon like, like, like Brian or even Will. Well, Brian and Will are really different because they're trailblazers in a whole, in a whole different research trajectories, but there are people who have uh, an idea, right? Uh, so Paul Leonardi would be an example here. And, and I know he's done a lot of stuff and everything, but the thing I, I uh, he has a 2008 paper with Steve Barley that's in information and organization, which is actually my favorite paper of his, but it's, uh, it's about really materiality and affordances at the time. That's right. But it's a beautifully written review paper. And I would say his big idea he pushed was materiality. And it was right around the time Vanda and, uh, Susan Scott did the uh, social materiality stuff. And, and it was just, you know, he, his imbrication came from his uh, materiality ideas and some material agency and stuff like that. But I think for five years or eight years or whatever of his life, he focused on materiality and unpacking it, really digging into it. And I think there are very few people who do that, where it's just a, a theoretical concept and they get at it from a number of different angles. I think more often, and these are the, uh, like in our generation, right? Not the old guys, but the kind of last uh, decade or two. The other one that I was thinking about, okay, who really rocked their career? Another one was Sinan Aral. And there are others who are similar profile, like Jerry Kane and some others who got into social media really early and took the classic, this is what Sinan Aral, this is how I, I think of his career. Social media is happening. But he didn't just say, I'm going to study social media. He went back and got all the classic social network tools. He was looking at homophily, diversity, you know, all the things that, that have been around for decades in, 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 in social network analysis. And he took this conceptual space. He took this new thing and then just spent 20 years using the fun, writing fundamental papers on homophily, on diversity, on whatever, in this new space. So it's not just that he became a social media expert. He brought the conceptual side to the social media. And then uh, another one I was thinking was Young Jin Yu, who did not, there's, I would say Young Jin, again, did a number of things, but for the last decade, his big thing was he's one of the big voices in this digital, digital yeah. innovation, digital this, digital that. He wrote one of the big papers on it. But he does it from a number of theoretical angles. So he did kind of deal with this very general phenomenon but, you know, he'll bring architecture one day, he'll bring social theory the next day, he'll, he'll get at the phenomenon from different views. So I was trying to think, is it the idea? That would be Leonardi. Is it the phenomenon? That would be, at least in my formulation, Young Jin. Or is it a theoretical and the phenomenon? And I think the commonality between these three, and maybe it's just a, an artifact of my preference, is that notice all three of them are very strong theoretically. So the ones that I had to pick, all right, who are the real big successes in our field in the last decade? They're all strong, strong conceptualizers, theorizers, and whether they're phenomenon focused or not is not. So well, that, I wonder that if that's might, just that might actually my be way because, of making sense. Of yeah, it. that's probably because that 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 fits like. your own yeah. uh, sort of way of looking at things, right? I mean, yeah. uh, when we talked to Brad Greenwood and he brought some of these key econometric papers like Brynjolf Sultan hit. I mean, yeah. they are in the same space in terms of impact, but they're empirical papers, right? And they're well, yeah, but I would call papers. that old school. That's, that's <laughs> the previous uh, rules. That's not the new rules, right? I'm trying to yeah. figure out what succeeds in the new rules of our game, not the, you know, in Brynjolfsson, of course. So I know. want to bring up a, one more example of a different type of career that I think is mm. very fascinating. And then I want to bring back some of the advice that I tend to give to people at that stage. And you, mm -hmm. I want you to tell me whether that's actually good advice, right? So the one example I still have here on my paper is Shirley Greger. Shirley Greger, uh, 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 the you know very eminent Australian lady. Again, I always bring up the Australian examples, of course, because that's where I'm from. But also because that country with its twenty-something universities is really punching above its weight. 
yeah. brilliant IS scholars, uh, you know, that, that are there with, you know, there's only what, 40 of them <laughs> overall, mm. right? It's really small. Anyway, so Shirley, Shirley really for a long time, she was working and she had this one paper. You know, she did a lot of things, but when you think of her, you think the nature of theory. Yeah. That's a paper, MISQ 2006, and that really made a career. And yeah. now, she, uh, since then, she moved also into design theorizing a little bit, too, which to me is just a variant of it. But that's she made a career out of one big paper, and it, it's a good career and very thoughtful. And I know some of the backtracking of this is obviously that paper took probably 10 years in the making, like from, from the first idea, right? So that's again, different to the Brian's and the Michael's and, and, and Will's and maybe even to, to Paul Leonardi because I'm talking about one paper, one, yeah. not a program, not 20 yeah. papers, just one. Paper. So what we do, so Sean Hansen and I call this, we, we always link people to uh, pop stars and we would call that the Charlie <laughs> the one hit wonder. Yeah, the one hit wonder. That's so she's like the Charlie Daniels of, uh, and do you know Charlie Daniels, man? You know this one? The devil went down to Georgia. Oh, that one. Yeah, I know. Devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for his soul to steal. He was in a bind. Well, so that song, that's one song that this guy and everybody knows. You're a German Australian, right? You know this song. I know this song. I probably know it from Futurama, I think. So there's the one hit wonders, and then there's like uh, (laughs) uh, maybe Kale, my advisor, is like the Tom Petty. Oh, he's Tom Maroon Daddy. Five, and right? Who's, and who's, and who's Taylor every Swift? Month, yes. Well, you know, Stefan Zeidel and I have this uh, uh, paper called "Tweeting Like Taylor Swift," and we just wanted Taylor Swift in a paper. We sent it to Hicks; it got in. It was whatever. But we compared tweeting of academics to tweeting of celebrities, and we found that there was a pretty big overlap of self promotion and all of that sort of thing. It's so probably also a big overlap there. in the sort of mutual readings between Taylor Swift and certain academics. Okay, yeah. now I like this. Um, uh, so your so, advice, wait, what was your advice? Your advice so was that's have one I, big That's hit? the next thing I wanted to, no, no, no. That's, I, I just think that that was an interesting uh, one because for a long time that really made a career. And, uh, you know, so one of the learnings there is that, you know, you can work on this one grand big idea and it can make a career in a, in a way. Like, mm-hmm. you know, so you don't have Absolutely. to, you don't have to go after 50 papers. You know, so that's I think that's a key lesson. You don't have to you don't have to do the multiplicity. It can stuff. make your career, but are you going to get tenure at a top school in in say Germany or the U.S. right now? I don't know where, because where, oh, where you know Shirley coming. was already a professor when she worked on that, arguably. So here's here's my advice. So, so when I, would I say she's in the old rules, her reputation, Bryn Yelson, these they're the old rules of success and preeminence in your field I but think that makes me rules. sad i mean because the only way out if you say like there are new rules new state of play is we got we are we telling people that they need to publish 10 papers and then they can start thinking about big ideas and big programs and big problems and but first make sure you you, you hit jis at least six times is that what we're saying i guess that's exactly what we're saying so this would be this would be my advice to young people and 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 uh i i try to and i i believe in theory Right. I think that the, the idea is not to be irrelevant, but the idea is to know what people have said before. And when you know what people, which means you read and you read a certain set of uh, authors that are publishing in the type of thing you want to do and you know what they've said. Now, you know what the existing state of knowledge is. You understand where, and then you contribute to that conversation. You contribute to that body of you try to enter that. And then that's how you build your reputation. That's how you build whatever. And and uh, I think the problem with a lot of young people is they spend too much time writing and data collection and methods and not enough time reading. And really their angle to getting in, especially to top tier journals, is still you know, making a theoretical contribution. And the only way you're gonna do that is by knowing what other people say and reading, right? So, so my big push for young people is read and yeah, read widely, but in particular, know the, the group that you want to be your reviewers to be your editors, to be right, you write what they you read. Yeah, what you they know, wrote, you know. To be very honest, can... like I, you've said this, and I've heard this from you. I, I can't even answer these questions for myself. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't know what my group is that I'm supposed to be talking to right now. Dude, I know what it is for you. It's the BPM group of the. No, we're see, that's back to you true. early in your career. <laughs> early in your career, now you're a senior. It doesn't matter what you do, but early in your career, you were reading Roseman stuff and all the BPM stuff. And I mean, that's what you were doing. That's what you, yeah, and you knew exactly 
current state, right? Early in my career, I knew every single enterprise systems paper for whatever reason I decided. And it's anybody doing social theory and enterprise systems, you know, Olga Volkov and, yep. and uh, Diane Strong. And yep. I knew that stuff inside and out, right? Uh, so now, yeah, I'm in a bunch of directions. So let me go back to the advice that, uh, that I try to give. And I try to make this a little bit structured. So what I sometimes like is some of the ideas about programmatic research. I know that's also an overused word, but there's some good ideas. And there's even some good papers on how to be programmatic, right? The idea of just saying like, like, don't look at one paper, think of it as one part of a program of work. And the program of work can lead to multiple papers. Then the question is, okay, how do you handle this? Um, and that there's people like Berthon that wrote about it. Andrew Burton Jones has written about it. And another guy, that was at my school, Guy Gable, he wrote about programmatic research, uh, or he at least talked about it for a while. Um, so here's the, the idea. So you can think about the research space as saying, look, you're in a domain and you're using certain method and you're, using, and you're contributing to certain theories. So theory, method, domain. That's mm -hmm. a way to look at this, right? So at any given point in time, you're in one space. If you think of it as a, as a three-dimensional space, you're at one point here. The question is, how do you move from that point? So you could stay in the domain say the domain is healthcare IT. You can stay in the domain, you can stay with the theory, but you can vary the method. You can move from qual to quant, from server to experiment, whatever, right? Or you, you say, I'm the method guy. I'm always gonna stick with in my method space. So I'm always gonna be the survey guy, but I'm moving domains. I'm moving from healthcare to insurance, from insurance to fin, from FinTech to whatever, right? So that's how you can move. And the key rule then is make sure that out of these three dimensions, you try to keep one or two of them stable. I and like you that. only move one. I never of them, thought that. Who wrote right? these papers? I don't even know these papers. Well, um, I'll, I'll put it on the in the show notes. One of them is mm -hmm. called Berthen et al. It, it appeared in uh, in in ISR, I think, in two thousand two, and he actually has that. They have that figure of that three dimensional space. Okay. So they didn't call it method domain theory, but that's basically the idea. They talk about replication. <laughs> sort of how you move across that space in replication, but I think it also applies to programmatic research. So, um, and, and that's a little bit what I did in my own PhD. And, and after this, I actually stayed in the same domain, process modeling, very tiny domain, um, stayed largely with the theory, but very method. Then I kept the method, but varied the theory, but stayed in the same domain. Later, I kept the theory and the method, but moved into a very different domain from, from process management to innovation. Big move, yeah. by the way. But anyway, so, you know, you can- Now you're writing in entrepreneurship journals. And, and then I moved to entrepreneurship, and, which is, yeah. uh, anyway, we can talk about this at a different place. But um, the idea is that you try, if you look at this and if you, that you don't try to vary all three variables at the same time. So you don't move from healthcare to finance, from survey to case study, and from social theory to, I don't know, some economic other theory, theory or something economic like theory in one go. Because that means you have nothing to cling on. You have to learn everything anew, right? Damn, I'm so, managing my career wrong. <laughs> That's what I find myself doing lately. <laughs> Dude, yeah, yeah, I don't true. know the method. I don't know the theory. And uh, and, know and, and again, you know, maybe we, we break it down to be very operational not to the end. The other, so that's one advice I would give. The other one that's is cool. classical like publication advice, which is... Um, revisions have priority over new submissions yeah. new ideas are always shinier but yeah. in this game in the system that we're in if you have an r and r revise and resubmit your odds of getting this published and ticking a box for all the deans that count your journals is so incredibly yeah. much higher that you got to prioritize that even though yeah. that thing you've worked you're on for three years you're sick of it. You're not as engaged as that new shiny idea. You want to do blockchain now, but you still have that do enterprise not system. Argue. <laughs> yeah. Especially as a junior person, just don't argue. Resist the urge to argue. The reviewers suck. They think they know more than you and they don't. You have to overwhelmingly respond to every single one of their comments and kiss their asses. It's awful that it's that way. Hopefully it'll change <laughs> in our lifetimes, but you kiss the reviewers' asses like nobody's business to get in and, and overwhelmingly do so, particularly early in your career uh, when no one knows you. Uh, but no, the best publication advice I ever got was the conversation advice, right? And it's, uh, oh, I can, well, I'll give you the name of the the paper uh research is a conversant we can put it up uh ann huff is her name she yeah. wrote this and and i i think it's the best advice in the world and it's just this that that it's like a dinner party uh you can't go into a dinner party and start talking to people by talking right i don't go up to I you and your friends 
and say, you want to know my opinion on blockchain or you want Actually, to know my that's opinion what you on do. COVID? You come to a dinner party and you don't even care what people are talking about. You just bring up your own stuff. I just Usually run my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> you go to a dinner party and you violate people's personal spaces, right? I remember <laughs> Physically. I remember this. I remember this about you. You're, you're very physical and intimate. Uh, it's just me. <laughs> in your, in your, your interactions with people of the same sex. So, uh, all right. So it's a conversation. You don't go to a dinner party and say, hey, you want to know what I think about COVID? No, you listen to the group, see what they're saying. And if they're saying, you would just agree. And if you have something to contribute, you contribute, but you listen first. So that's what research is. It's a conversation. The conversation is happening in the journals. You listen first, and then you give back people what they said, and then you point out you know, your uh, points of agreement and, and disagreement and extension and that sort of thing. So it's a conversation. And if you think of it that way, then it becomes reading first, then writing, which I think is the way to get published, particularly at a good journal. So. Anyway. Well, we, we talked about this before. I mean, I agree with you on the, uh, you know, we gotta, we gotta read more. And the question becomes, okay, how do we get the people to read more? Like, what do we do? Like, you, there's this famous story about that you, that your advisor gave you 20 books to read and say, come yeah. back when you read them, right? So, you know, that's not institutionalized practice for, for PhD students anywhere, right? Yeah, it should um, be. So, well, maybe it should be, right? So, so, you know, I agree with you, but that's probably my, my own family background. We come from a literature sort of family. We all read a lot. <laughs> um, mm. So, you know, that, that probably helps. I think it helps also with writing uh, you know forget the main, don't forget the theory just like like understanding how different authors write you know yep. that's that's a lot so no um, the kiss the reviewers ask of course i'm gonna say well you don't have to do that uh, you got to be polite you got to be polite and you got to respond I, th I think people forget what it means to respond to something respond doesn't mean that you have to kiss as and you have to do everything but, you know, they made a comment and they're asking to respond to the comment. And there's many, many very different ways in which you can respond to comment. But um, so trying to bring it back to um, sort of different different career path. Uh, one very interesting talk that I listened to uh, a couple of years ago was by uh, Andrew Pettigrew, who's again, as an old scholar, he's from Oxford. Sure, and sure. he's uh, very known in his strategy process literature, right? So he studied um, um, sort of big oil companies, how they moved and changed strategic yeah. direction over 10 years, which was, was something he? you could do back then. He was, he's, he's at Oxford still. Oxford, okay. Right, uh, sort of probably uh, retired by now, but yeah. So he gave a talk, which again, He's British and he's clearly influenced by this movement in the UK with this impact assessment of, of scholarly output. Anyway, so, but he gave a talk and he talks about identity. So he asked, who do you want to be? Not what do you want to be and how much do you want to publish, but who do you want to be? And he said, realize that there are different choices of academic identity for you as an individual. You can be the scholar, which is probably what you are, a well-read scholar, you know the literature, you know the Foucaults and Habermas as well as you know, the I think that's who I want to be, whether exactly. I'm there, you want to do that's that, who I would want right? to be. Then there are the researchers that the, the, these are the supras, the guys that are really good at certain methods and they bring the field forward. And these are the guys that invented, I don't know, PLS and run experiments and stuff like that. And I know a few people are like this. Marcus Weinmann, for example, really good digital experimentalist guy. Um, then there are other ones. There are public intellectuals. These are the guys that, yeah. you know, make policy advice. Really yeah. cool. You know, yep. very different. So he basically comes on and says, "There are, and, and of course, we haven't even talked about it. There are teachers, there yep. are people that, that you know that go to university because they want to teach. We haven't even yep. talked about that, right?" So he, his including those is, that teach doctoral students. So I would say Isaac Ben Bisset, right? Look at him; he's trained half the field, and he publishes with them. And and sure, he has his own ideas. He's a scholar. He's brilliant, but but you could tell this guy's a teacher. He he loves yeah. collect. You know, so. True, true, right? So he says, what you got to realize, we do have a choice. You do have a choice. And I think that goes back to your early point about self-reflection and sort of you can reflect on which of these you want to be. You know, you want to be. You want to be the scholar. You want to be the public intellectual. I think to me, it always means like pick one of them. Don't pick all of them. Don't exactly. try to be the scholar, researcher, intellectual, public intellectual, everything, right? Maybe one of the things you like better. Then the second thing, which I think I what like people often forget is he says, well, the same goes for universities. There's different types of universities, yeah. right? We have the top business schools where the deans um, uh, count the journals. Well, they're researcher identity business schools, Yeah. yeah. right? Then there are this very traditional uh, historical sort of 
uh, uh, you know, uh, universities for the sake of truth and the ivory tower type of uh, universities. The scholarly. The scholarly, scholarship. right? So they're, yeah. they're, they're university like this. In Germany, that would be, for example, Freie University Berlin, where mm. big, big social thinkers come from. Very theoretical. You don't find an empiricist there, you oh, know, geez. but they're mm. big, big ideas, guys. And then, of course, there are technical universities, right? Mm. And uh, they do different things. And then there are sort of regional uh, universities. Oh, so okay. he says, you have an identity, and so do universities. And the key thing then becomes a match. Right. So right. if you're the uh, engaged scholar and you want to build things and help a region community and help building apps, well, maybe you shouldn't go to Oxford because they probably don't want to have you. Right. And, uh, you know, a technical university in Munich is looking for different people than, uh, I don't know, Yale yeah, and, and Stanford yeah. And, and, and Harvard and so forth. So I, I like this a lot. It's a nice way to look at the, the situation, of course, especially the who do you want to be? The scholar, the researcher, the teacher, or whatever. I love that. Good. Well, on that note, I think you solved all our problems. I did, as usual. <laughs> all right. We'll uh, talk again next time. Good talking to you. See you.